Hello class, this is Valigan. I would like to talk with you today about the stages of HIV. This is also known as HIV disease progression. Um, and this video is part one of two. Uh, and we will uh, go from the immediate transmission of HIV up to HIV testing and the window period. So. HIV disease progression. Um, progression as a word means the development over time. Um, and so HIV disease progression includes every stage of the disease from that, f that transmission on day one um, to late stage disease and everything in between. Uh, this is also known as the clinical course of a disease. That's, that's the term that you might hear medical professionals talk about um, is uh, cl the clinical course. Um, but so we look at the stages of HIV because we want to track how HIV works and what someone might expect in an HIV infection. We want to identify patterns that can help make decisions um, about when to start and stay on treatment, also when to stop treatment. Um, uh, but it's important to realize that we don't have a crystal ball here. Um, the stages of HIV don't have a set amount of time um, that it takes for them to happen and not everybody is going to go through all of them at the same time. So. Um, where this is not a prediction, um, we don't use this as a um, as the ultimate rule because everybody's body is different, um, but it does sort of give us a general sense of what to expect. So we know that after a decade of HIV infection, half of people have no symptoms. Ten years following HIV infection with no treatment, 50% of people have no symptoms of any kind. Um, so, and this is a study, this is from a study that was done before we had effective medicines to stop HIV, and it tells us that half of people will have no symptoms for 10 years following the day of HIV infection. Now, some people may develop AIDS or, or get sick from HIV, develop symptoms within three years of HIV infection, while others haven't developed AIDS for 20 years or more. So again, there's no crystal ball. There's no way to predict what's going to happen with anybody. Uh, so this is just an overview of the clinical stages of HIV. Not every person is going to go through all these stages, and they don't always go in exactly this order. But we're looking at viral transmission, acute or initial infection, seroconversion, asymptomatic stage, symptomatic stage, the stage known as AIDS, um, which we've talked about in a previous lesson, uh, advanced disease or late stage disease. Um, and we're going to start um, actually with a little bit of a back step. Um, now back in the day, HIV was viewed as an infection of the blood. Um, it was something that uh, was um, seen as only being a part of the blood. But today we understand it better to be an infection of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system, it's got that word lymph in it. Um, and just like lymph nodes, it's like the, the lymphatic system is the highway between all of the lymph nodes, um, and the lymphatic system incorporates the immune system and the circulatory system. Uh, so HIV really is an infection of that system uh, rather than just the blood. So when we're talking about acute or initial infection, uh, from that, from the virus being transmitted. Um, however it happens, uh, in whatever the body fluid it is that transmit HIV and however it is that that body fluid got into somebody else's bloodstream, once the virus is in somebody else's bloodstream, it, ma it multiplies really quickly and it produces a massive amount of virus. Um, this stage is generally um, considered to be from two to four weeks, uh, kind of the first month after infection. Uh, the increase in virus means a big decrease in CD4 cells. Um, and because of that, some individuals get a flu-like symptoms, including rash or fever or night sweats. Uh, in this time, HIV finds what are known as the sanctuary sites. Um, and these are places that HIV can get to, but then the meds have a hard time getting to. So lymph nodes, central nervous system, genital tract, or other organs. 
Uh, and these are all places where once the virus has established itself in these sanctuary sites, which happens during the phase of initial infection, um, someone can be on meds and the meds will uh, find any HIV that's in the bloodstream and interfere with its life cycle. But once that person stops meds, the virus starts to reproduce again. And it starts to reproduce again because it has headquarters set up in all of these sanctuary sites. Um, these are places that the meds have a hard time getting to. So there is the um, possibility actually of eradicating HIV during acute infection using AIDS drugs. Um, if somebody knows they've been exposed and starts taking meds within 72 hours of exposure, um, and it, it, this says they'll be able to stop taking them later, and usually that course of medicine lasts for a month. Um, the idea is to kick HIV's butt before it can get to the sanctuary sites, um, and this is known as post-exposure prophylaxis. We'll be talking more about this in depth later. But just for now, you um, should understand that it is possible to um, stop HIV from getting to the sanctuary sites, but it has to happen. It only works if we get to it within two to three days after exposure. Um, and most people, that isn't true for most people. So the stage after acute or initial infection is known as seroconversion. Um, and this word breaks down, the root sero here means blood, and conversion means change. So the change in blood that we're talking about is that now there, the body's immune response to HIV begins to be found in the blood. The immune response kicks in and starts to kick HIV in the butt. Um, so antibodies are produced, um, HIV-specific CD4s kick in, but they might be destroyed. Um, killer cells or CD8 cells start killing HIV and infected cells. Um, and if HIV-specific CD4s survive this period, those are the CD4s that recognize HIV and know that it's something that they need to react to, um, the immune system can keep the upper hand for a long time. Um, and then the viral load goes to set point, um, which is to say it stops having such a such a massive rise. So we're going to look at this graphically here. This is a graph of trans viral load after transmission occurs. So this axis represents time, uh, and this axis represents the amount of virus in the bloodstream. So this point right here is transmission. Um, that is the day that someone has um, a new HIV infection. Transmission occurs and this is what the viral load does. It goes way up and then it comes back down and sort of evens out a bit. And the point at which it starts to come down is seroconversion. The CD4s begin to respond, antibodies are produced, um, and then that level there is known as the viral load set point. So an HIV test doesn't look for HIV itself, it actually looks for antibodies. And the first test that we do is the ELISA test. Usually that comes in the form of a finger stick or an oral swab. Sometimes it's a blood draw. Um, if the first ELISA test detects antibodies, they'll run a second ELISA right away. If that second ELISA also comes up positive, they'll run a Western blot test. Um, and that's a test that has to be done in a lab. Um, it's more expensive and more precise. Um, but together, these, this method is more than 99% accurate. Um, this question says there could still be false negatives. Why? Um, and the answer to that question is that false negatives could happen. Um, that is, somebody takes an HIV test that looks for antibodies and it comes up negative, but it's false because they actually are HIV positive. It's just that their body hasn't produced enough antibodies for the test to read. So that would that could happen if somebody was infected, say, two weeks ago, um, that their their body hasn't the immune response hasn't kicked in thoroughly enough that the test can find uh, the antibodies. So that's what's known as the window period. Uh, it is possible to test negative on an antibody test but still be HIV positive. If the HIV test is done before the immune system has produced enough antibodies, the test will not detect them. Uh, almost everybody produces antibodies within six months. Um, and this is why it's important for individuals to be tested a full six months after engaging in any behavior that might have put them in risk. 
and not have new risk between the two tests. Uh, so I will see you in part two of this presentation.